A reading from 2 Corinthians. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. To be a good Christian, it helps to be bad at math. Now, I'm looking out at some of my math friends, and I see your eyebrows being raised by all of this. I know you object. And if I were talking about actual numbers, I understand. I mean, it's true, you can't even understand the structure of the universe without math. I mean, God's glory and beauty is actually revealed in this higher math. Astrophysicists are also mathematicians for a reason. Their equations tell us that the cosmos is ordered in an intelligible way by our creator who doesn't play dice with the world, as Einstein once put it. Now, I admit that I'm more of a word guy than a numbers person, don't you know? So this sermon fits me, and, and, but I don't really want you to blame me for any of your miscalculations. Like, for instance, it, it don't, if you mess up on your tax return and the IRS comes after you, please don't tell them, well, my preacher told me, you know, that I was just being a good Christian by being sloppy with math. You know, and if you have a math test in school, kids, you know, and you do poorly on it, please don't tell your teacher that you're just being a good Christian and following your pastor's sermon. You know that I'm leading you down a primrose path here, right? What I mean, of course, is that we shouldn't carry our accounting over into the world of spiritual and personal relationships. Being good at math can make you bad at love and friendship. Listen again to what the Apostle Paul said about what God has done for us. In Christ, God was reconciling the world unto himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Not counting Think about that. God is bad at math too. Not bad so much as choosing not to make it the basis of relationship with us. God canceled our sin in Christ Jesus. God forgave our debts. God decided that unconditional love would be the basis of God's relationship with us, not the making up of our sins. The Methodist evangelist and former seminary president, Maxie Dunham, tells a story of a former Catholic nun named Mary Levac, who now works in a Methodist church. She had had a horrible upbringing. Her father left her mother with 14 children when Mary was just five years old. So imagine the sense of abandonment that she carried around, the low self-esteem, the sense of disappointment and being unloved. And so as a young woman, she entered a convent. And here are some of her words about that experience. I entered the convent for two reasons. One, I felt the Lord calling me to a closer life with him. And two, 
I was such a scrupulous individual and needed direction in the depths of my spirit because I did not really understand what this closer walk with the Lord meant for me. I was of the mind that I had to make up for my sins. And so as a teenager in the middle 1950s, faced with a time when it came time to do something with my life, I was of the opinion that it would be difficult for me to love one person to the exclusion of all others, and marriage therefore seemed out of the question, even though I felt that was a stronger personal desire than going into the convert, convent, but I needed to make up for my sins. And so I thought God must be calling me into the convent. Two of my sisters had entered the convent before me, and I was definitely of the mind that I had to do something to make up for my sins. And having been led into the convent, I was blessed. I found the Lord in a most beautiful, intimate way, but I also found community life to be very threatening. And five years later, I ran away because it was too difficult for me in the sense that I was in too much inner turmoil. I was very closed mouth. I wasn't really a person who shared what was going on inside of her. I didn't know you could, I didn't know that you could do that, that you could open up and be respected for that. And so I left the convent. Because I hadn't been counseled properly, I went right into another depression and thought, well, I guess I've really blown it now. I've divorced the Lord. And I'm never going to get into heaven. So I went back into my wounded position and cried and wept and prayed. And somehow I felt God must have moved heaven and earth and Rome because they let me back into the convent. And again, I was blessed. This time I had a little more help in finding out what was really the source of the problem. The word of the Lord came to me through a priest to whom I admitted having entered the convent among other reasons for the sake of making up for my sins. When he heard this, he literally wept. And then he said, oh my God, didn't anyone ever tell you that Jesus did that? You don't have to do that. You can't do that. Just receive his forgiveness. I'm so glad it was a Catholic priest who said that. Good work, Father. It's because of the good work of the Father that he did. And here's what that good Father told Mary. God made up for our sins when we could not by not counting them against us. God made the sinless Son of God to take on our sins in order to exchange them for God's righteousness. This great exchange is what the word reconciliation literally means, you know. It's an accounting term, and it means literally exchange. Imagine walking into a bank where you have an outstanding loan. You and the banker both know you've got no chance of paying it off, right? And so instead of taking your car or your house, along with your dignity as a human being, your banker instead hands you the loan documents and you look and it has stamped on it, paid in full, reconciled. The bank decided to reconcile your account in your favor. Now, I doubt you're going to find many bankers who actually are going to do that for you. Sometimes banks do write off bad debts from their financials, but even then the debtors themselves have to live with the consequences of their defaults. Sins are bad debts that can never be paid off ourselves. They are faults that drive us into eternal default. But instead, God takes our sin into God's own life and bears the cost of it for us. God forgives our debts, reconciles our account, and exchanges God's joy and life for it. 
All God asks us to do in return is to accept the new terms of relationship. Not to go down our own way, but to be bound in love the way God is bound to us in love. When we talk about being a Christian, this is what we mean. We accept our forgiveness. And then we live as forever forgiven sinners. This is the essence of the prodigal son story we read earlier. The prodigal son is not the focus of this story. It's the loving father where the attention should be focused. The father doesn't hold the sin's sons against him. He welcomes him home. He throws a party. The father will not even wait to hear the son's confession. He interrupts him because the new rule is that he only, the son, has to accept his acceptance by dropping his speech and coming inside. But that should lead us to go and do likewise. Paul says we should operate the same way with each other and be as bad at accounting as God is. And this is just as hard for us as it was for the elder brother. It's hard for us to accept that God would treat us that way. Everything about the world that is passing away in favor of the world that God is bringing to pass says that if we are responsible human beings, we have to be accountable for our actions. Well, there's another variation on that word again, accounting and accountable. We might worry that if we take all accountability away, oh my goodness, the world's going to fall into chaos and everything is going to be ruined. We can't count on anything if we don't any longer have the principle of accounting for sin as the basis of everything. The world was already falling apart before. And that's the whole point. So what God has done is to make us accountable for forgiveness instead of sin. We're not accountable for our sin now. We're accountable for the fact that God has forgiven us. Will we accept that? And the way that we live into that forgiveness is by forgiving others. The way we prove that we are reconciled to God is by being reconciled to others. Paul says that his ministry and ours is to be ambassadors of this reconciliation. This is the call to Christians. We live now not from a human point of view, but from a spiritual one, not according to the flesh, but the spirit. We look at each other now, not according to old debts. We look at each other now according to the new accounting rules that God has written. How do we do this? We don't base our relationships with one another any longer on the unsettled accounts of unsatisfied grievances that we hold with each other. We don't sit around waiting for others to make up for their sins against us. We take all the hurt and the brokenness and the pain that has been between us and we take it deep into our own lives deep enough until we find the place inside of us where Christ lives. And we offer it to him there because he alone knows what to do with it. And he has done something with it. He's taken it and forgiven it. And then we can let it go. Then we can seek to live toward others who have sinned against us as if they haven't. We look for ways now to restore relationships in love because that is what God has done for us. A community in the south of Poland had a difficult decision to make. The year was 1921, so it was just a few years after the end of World War I and the devastation that that war had caused in that region. A Quaker woman, a Christian nurse, 
had dedicated her life to helping rebuild that community and serving the people of that region. And she had worked tirelessly and selfishly, uh, selfish, selflessly uh, for these years after the war. And the community came to a crisis at the point of her death. Where would she be buried? You see, the, the whole region was Roman Catholic and the only cemetery was the church cemetery. And there were rules, you know. The church had to be clear that only baptized Catholics could be buried within the church cemetery because those were holy grounds and only if you were baptized as a Catholic could the church be assured that you had your original guilt forgiven in baptism and so it was reserved for Catholics. Now remember this was 1921. So they did the only thing the rules let them do. They buried her just outside the cemetery. This didn't settle well with the people of that community. They understood that the institutional church had its rules about who could be in and who could be out, both in this life and the next. But later that night, the people of the community got together under the cloak of darkness and they rewrote the rules. They moved the fence. And when morning broke, that precious Christian woman was now buried inside the cemetery and nobody ever moved it again. This is the picture of what it means to be ministers of reconciliation. God has moved the fences for us in order to include us. We have fellowship with God, not because of what we have done or failed to do, but because of who God is and what God has done in Jesus Christ. We then are called to follow in kind. We are to look for ways to have fellowship with one another. And by the way, it is so much sweeter when we do that with one another while we and they are still alive. This is the new math. And God is counting on us to learn it for ourselves and to live it with one another. Amen.